All right. Our next session is going to be about Babylon uh, that's forming. It's here alive and well. And um, I think once we start exploring it and seeing how its tentacles are in almost every facet of life, you might just start saying, wow, I didn't realize how influential Babylon is. Now, just so, we'll do some background, then I'll bring in some concurrent events and, and how it's doing that. But understand what Babylon really is. It started back uh, with Satan inspiring, obviously, Nimrod to create uh, not only just a man-made religion. That's where all idolatry, all man-made religions came from. But it was tied to an economic issue and a political issue. It's, it has three legs to it. And uh, obviously with Nimrod, um, they were garnering the worship of the people there towards the heavens, and it wasn't towards God, it was to demons. And uh, they basically had a, a, a one-world government, a one-world religion, one-world economy all going there. And obviously God broke that up, but it's still with us. It dispersed, and it's still with us. And what we're seeing is it's ramping up. And when we see this ramp up, this convergence of different things, it then reminds us of what Jesus said, that we're living in the last days. And I know we, we sometimes use that, that phrase, last days, and sometimes people will question that. Well, we've been living in the last days for 2,000 years. Whoa, wait a second. That's not entirely accurate. What, I, what it means but by last days, Jesus gave a sign for the last days. The disciples in the Olivet Discourse asked the Lord, what will be the sign of your return? What will be the sign of the end of the age? And what will be the sign of the end of, of Jerusalem or the destruction of the temple? Now, Paul has said we've lived in the last days, but this is not the same thing. Um, when Jesus answered one of those three questions, the sign of the end of the age, the age that he was living in, the disciples were living in, the age that we're in, he uses, uh, he goes through a lot of non signs, nation. Uh, nation um, There'll be various skirmishes in different places and various locations, wars and rumors of wars. There'll be false Christs. And those are all non-signs. Non-signs. But then he goes in and he says, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there'll be various earthquakes in various places. When he used the term, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, that is a rabbinic term. What that means is, the rabbis used to use some Old Testament passages and they put them together and they said, when there's world war, then Messiah will come. And that used to be the old Judaism line, even through Jesus' day. Jude, uh, Jesus picks up on that term and uses the rabbinic term in the Olivet Discourse and says, boys, when you see world war, then that's the sign for the end of the age. Okay. Well, then that means that World War I and World War II, the continuation of World War I, that was the first time in, his, in the history of man that there actually was a world war. And there was famines and earthquakes in various places when that was issued. Hence... It is proper to say biblically that we are living in the last days because the sign has been given, world war. And now we don't know how long that goes. Uh, there's not an ending point. We just know it's, it's begun. And it, it is biblically accurate to say that we're living in the last days. That being the case, if we are in the last days, we should expect to see the rise of Babylon. Because man, when the tribulation starts, she is front and center. She is the main ruler of this planet. Now, I'm saying it metaphorically, like the scriptures, that it's, it, you know, it's metaphorically a, a woman, but it's a system. And I'm going to tell you what, the system is alive and well. And we're going to look at it. We'll do some background research. But uh, it might shock you of where she is involved in and where she's at. So let's take a look a little bit about 
uh, in Revelation 17, um, again, the prediction of this during the, um, during the tribulation period, but it says this, But then one of the seven angels who had seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. We'll explain all of this. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So just to pause here so we can get our bearings, the system will be supported by the one world government. We talked about the one world government and how it's rising and that globalism is alive and well. That globalism will support the whore, will support this politico, religio, religio uh, economic system that they all will go to bed with. Notice it says that the kings of the earth committed fornication with her. Metaphorically, they're in bed with her, so to speak. That's what the, the, the idea of fornication is, is that they're cutting a deal with her. She gives them something they want. And there's a, a, an exchange that's happening. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But notice, again, the beast that she rides, obviously, is the final form of that one world government, and she's supported by it. But only three and a half years. Because eventually, if you read into more into Revelation 17, the kings of the earth turn on her, destroy her, because the Antichrist then wants the full worship. And he became, becomes the main religion centered in a man. But she is used to be the glue that puts it all together. It's interesting that back in history, if you study uh, Emperor Constantine, that when he was trying to unite the Roman Empire, he did it by using Christianity and a lot of false versions because they brought in a lot of paganism. But even Emperor Constantine knew in order to glue the Roman Empire together, because it was so large, he needed a religion to do it with. And hence it started you know, the, the apostasy that started infiltrating the church, but it was the glue. Now, Satan knows this. He knows people are deeply spiritual. I didn't, say, I didn't say Christian. I said spiritual. Because a lot of the problems today is people are walking away of, from Christianity, but they're walking right into spirituality. They'll, they'll claim to be spiritual, and they'll do all kinds of wackadoo things, obviously, but they do claim that because Satan knows that God has put it into our hearts. He's put eternity into our heart, according to Solomon in Ecclesiastes. We know we're more than just flesh. We know there's a spiritual reality. And so, obviously, there's counterfeits to that. But Satan knows that. And so he uses that to glue this thing together. Okay. Let's continue on Revelation 17. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations. Now, just to understand this is she is extremely wealthy. There is money with her. By the way, just as an aside, religion is a money-making racket. Oh, my lanta. <laughs> If you saw the salaries of some of these apostates, like Joel Olstein, and $40 million, are you kidding me? Stephen Furtick, up in the millions, lives in a, 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 a 16,000 square foot home, and they're saying, I'm blessed of God. Listen, anytime you see a false teacher, a false prophet, or a false religion, there is big money behind it. The Roman Catholic Church can't even be estimated how much wealth they have. Some of their things are, are, are priceless, like a Michelangelo, like a Sistine Chapel. They control major billions of dollars. The Mormon Church comes in a, a second, a far second, but think, think of the cult of the Mormons, how much money they have. So anytime you see false religion, the whore is there with her money. And she can offer this. 
if you cut a deal with her. And these kings of the earth are cutting a deal because she does offer this money. So it, it continues on and it says, it's a cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. This is where all false religions and idolatry come from her, right? And on her forehead, a name was written. Now catch this. It, he's going to show, show you what's called the first satanic mystery. There's two satanic mysteries in the New Testament. Now what I mean by mystery, it's not, oh, it's mysterious. It means it wasn't revealed in the Old Testament, and now it's being revealed in the New Testament. There are actually eight mysteries in the New Testament. Paul, like the rapture, was a mystery. Wasn't told about. The church was a mystery. So we have these different mysteries. There's two satanic mysteries. Again, not told in the Old Testament, but then brought out through progressive revelation in the New and here, let's read it. Mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. Okay? Well, what's mysterious about that? Well, we, we know from the Old Testament that all idolatry, all false religions came from Babylon. We know that. We know uh, where she was centered and what she tried to do. We understand that. And that she continues to, to exist. Okay? Well, what's, what's the mystery about it, what we didn't know? Well, the mystery uh, is that she would be a religio, political, economic system. That would be the first thing. And that Babylon will develop into a one world unified religion and will rule the world religiously for the first half of the tribulation. That was never predicted. We didn't know that in the Old Testament. We didn't know that until John actually reveals this in 95 AD. And, and so Satan is going to use this to solidify what he is trying to do. Now, to understand Babylon, there's always a counterfeit to what God's doing. God uses Israel as his vehicle in the Old Testament and then eventually in the, in, into the uh, the, the future, he'll use her as a vehicle, okay? Then right now, he's using the church as a vehicle to spread the knowledge of him, right? So Satan also counterfeits it, and basically, if you can understand the counterfeit, it's Babylon. That's the system he's using. It's a counterfeit church. It's a counterfeit Israel. It's a system that involves three legs on that stool, a religious aspect, a political aspect, and an economic aspect. That's how you understand her. Now, notice that she's called the whore of Babylon, or she's called a prostitute. Well, what, what, is it, what is John trying to get at? Well, it's this. It's the, it's the, the use of religion and perverting it. Now, James will talk about, in his book, true religion. And basically, he'll say, well, true religion is helping widows and orphans. And he'll just throw that out there. And basically, what he was saying is, look, the outworking of your discipleship is that you serve. And you serve the, you know, the least fortunate in the congregation or, or around your community or whatnot. Again, it's not social justice. Don't get me wrong there. It's, it's serving those who need help in the body of Christ and, and obviously the Good Samaritan type of thing. The principle is service. True religion, according to the Bible, is serving. Serving. What the whore does is take religion, perverts it like a prostitute perverts sex. She perverts it and misuses it and uses religion to rule, to lord it over. So anytime you see a false religion, like the Catholic Church, let's just throw that out there, what does it do? You have a, a pope ruling over people. And so that's a classic example of that, where you have a lording it over. And Jesus told the early church, I hate the practice of the Nicolaitans. Nico means rule. Laetian means laity, ruling the laity. I cannot stand that. I hate that. When people rule over, 
And so you have a lot of pastors doing that, false religions. And so that's how she perverts it. She prostitutes religion and rules through money. See, people will let you rule them if you give them what they want. Give me my Obama phone. Give me my free health care. Give me whatever. Give me my ration of food, and I will do what you tell me to do. Just keep giving it to me. That's how she cuts deals with people, and she's real good at cutting a deal. The system works very well, by the way. So anyway, the, that's what he's saying is that they, she's fornicating with the kings, basically the leaders of these countries, to do this. Okay, that being the case, then let's look at the three legs of the stool and get specific about what's happening right now currently. Well, the first thing, the first leg of the stool, the global false religion aspect of her. Now, as Eric talked about with the apostasy in the church, okay, that's one category of false teaching is apostasy. And there's no doubt she has her hooks in the church. She has infiltrated the church. There's no doubt about it. It's causing the great apostasy right in front of our very eyes. But it's more than just the apostasy of the church. It branches out into false religion. The biggest false religion right now on the planet is the green movement. And you think, what? what's the green movement? It's this whole radical environmentalism. Now, it's a perfect religion, so to speak, that could actually glue the entire world because in the green religion, all religions are welcome. And they come under a supra umbrella of creation care, caring for the planet because Gaia, the, the mother goddess Earth, is alive and we need to take care of her. Otherwise, there's a, a eschatological doom if we don't take care of the planet. She's a perfect match for a super religion. But it's there. Now, there's aspects to her. And what I want to just quickly go over, it's a blending of religions, okay? There's a little bit here, there's a little bit there, some Mormonism, some Catholicism, some New Age, some witchcraft, some Satanism. It's all cafeteria spirituality brought into one. It tolerates all religions except, guess what, one. Biblical faith. Biblical Christianity, she cannot stand as an, she's intolerant, to, but we're intolerant, and she cannot stand the Jews. Those are the two groups she hates, the Jews and the Christian, the real Christians. I use that term <laughs> sparingly because sometimes not everybody that claims to be a Christian is a Christian. She's, she believes that sincerity is king. As long as you're sincere in your beliefs, your doctrines are secondary. But you just, if you feel good about that, don't worry about it. Sincerity is the most important. Or she blends in a syncretism, which is the common denominator, which means all these things are brought into one. All these things are put in positions, and there's a, a synthesis that happens. She's of, of every religion, Hinduism, Buddhism, all that stuff. And there's an accommodation, especially made to anyone that will twist the scriptures to make it say what they want it to say. That's the major problem we're having today, is that we have pastors who don't know the context of the scriptures, don't know especially the Jewish context of the scriptures, don't know Hebraic idioms, don't know what it said, and hence, Cults start because of that. Let me give you an example of a, a not understanding the Scriptures. Jesus will talk to Nicodemus, and you know this passage very well. Nicodemus, you must be born again. You must be born of water uh, and of the Spirit. Cults capitalize on the water aspect because they don't know the Hebraic meaning behind that. And so they say, ah, see, you have to be baptized in order to be saved. But if they knew the Jewish culture and the way they talked, they would know what Jesus was referring to. He was telling Nicodemus, you must be born a human being, and the actual the water he was referring is, is the water inside a woman who gives birth. That's what the Jews understood. 
He was telling Nicodemus, number one, you've got to be born a human being, and then number two, you've got to be born of the Spirit, which is regeneration, given eternal life. But, okay, something so simple as, okay, I say understanding of, of water does not refer to water bathroom, but yet major cults started because of that, because they simply didn't know the text or they twisted it. Again, that's just one example, but you can go further and further. And right now, the scriptures are being twisted into the social justice movement. That's what's happening. And so they'll take Matthew 25. I was in prison. You came and visited me. I was hungry and you fed me. Do you understand that the context of that is the sheep and goat judgment? It has nothing to do with, you know, let's go feed peanut butter and jelly sandwich to the poor. Nothing wrong with that. But what I'm talking about is don't take that out of path, that context uh, out of its place. The brethren in Matthew 25, when you did to the least of these my brethren, he's referring to the Jews. There's three groups there. There's the, 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 the sheep and the goat, saved and unsaved Gentiles, and then my brethren, my biological brethren. And you can re re uh, refer that to, I think, Micah 4, is the, the brethren is called is the remnant of Israel, his biological brethren. But you see, that's the thing. But the problem in Christianity that we're having is people are so uneducated for the Scriptures, the pastor can say anything, and everyone will say, yeah, that sounds great, man. That's awesome. And, and then not know how to cor correct that. And that's the problem. So, again, it, it goes to accommodation. And the last one is ecumenical, and you've heard that term before, that all religions lead to this supreme deity in which they worship, and so all these paths are valid. And what's the object? The object is to bind all mankind in blind and absolute submission to a hierarchy entirely dependent upon the global government. Did you catch that? Do you see how that blends with the government? She is trying to get people dependent on their government. Hey, I'm the first one to tell you, California is going all dependent on the government. And they love it. Now, the people that don't like it are fleeing California. But we have a welfare state in California. People are dependent on their food stamps because they don't want to work. You could actually make more money not working in California than actually going to work and working at Burger King. I mean, that's crazy, I know. But that's why Jerry Brown opens the borders and just says, come on over, I'll just give you all kinds of free money. Notice this. So many people take advantage of the public school system because they'll feed your kid three times a day. What? Yeah. Breakfast, lunch, and then before you leave on that bus, they'll feed you for dinner at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Well, wait a second. Where do the parents come in on this? But the, parent, the parents come in at lunch and have lunch with them. I mean, it's, it is a complete, just never give back, taker system. And what it's ha what's happening is exactly what the Babylon whore wants. She wants people dependent on their state or government. And it's happening. They love it. The good work ethic of get out there and work, it's gone. Why would I work when I can get a freebie, they're thinking. And once you take money from her, it is over. For instance, I'll tell you what churches are doing in California. Maybe they're doing it here in Oregon. I don't know. Churches go on their heads because their populations are declining. And it's not because the pastor's not usually doing his job. It's just people are not responding to the gospel. And the, the, the true believers are leaving the state. Okay. So what does a pastor to do to pay for his facilities, to pay all the bills he has? Well, I can tell you what they, a lot of them do. They start running a preschool. Okay. Okay, nothing wrong with that, but they start running a state preschool. Because guess what? There's big money in a state preschool. Man, you could be running 10 people, and it'd be your family that you're preaching to, and you'll, you'll survive for the next 20, 25 years off a state-ran preschool. It's so highly wanted because it's so much money is involved in that. It keeps churches afloat. So almost every church I know that's struggling starts a, a state-ran preschool. Okay, guess what? You get the state in your business, they will tell you how you're going to run your state-run program. 
and they will tell you, you take down these crosses, you take down these pictures of Jesus, you take down these holidays that you're celebrating like Christmas and Easter, and, and you will do what we tell you to do. And we'll have in, surprise inspections, and we'll, we'll, if you want this money, you will comply. And guess what the churches do? Do they say, no way, we will, we will not bow down to Caesar? No, they don't say that. They say, okay, how much and how long, man? I'll, just, I'll do whatever you tell me to do because I'm on my head and i got to pay the bills. The, what she's doing is making even the churches compromise by taking her money. And there you go, the crosses come down. The pictures of Jesus come down or whatnot in the preschool. For what? Filthy mammon. Unrighteous mammon. That's how she's getting people to compromise. That's what all of this is about. So basically, she's hijacking the churches. She's hijacking major areas of society. So this one, this one hijack of the churches is this. She's got to infiltrate the church, and she's doing a, a, great, a great job at it. Let me give you another example of how she's hijacking the churches. You ever heard of a rent an evangelical or a rent, a, a rent a mascot for evangelicals? You need to become familiar with that term because George Soros is doing it in his foundations. What do you mean? Well, remember this social justice that Eric and I are talking to you about? A lot of the churches are actually receiving money by supporting unvetted immigration into the United States because they're getting big money from George Soros-funded organizations to take in refugees. And it's big money. I mean big. I mean right there in Kern County where I'm at, the Catholic Church is really big on this stuff. They love it. You get money for taking them in. You get money for teaching them. You get money to teach them to drive. You get all kinds of subsidies from these foundations that are George Soros funded. That's why the liberal churches are like, we want open borders. Bring them all in. We don't care if they assimilate. We don't care if we can't check their backgrounds. We don't know. We don't care because we get money for them. So they're all for open borders, amnesty, racial reconciliations, all this nonsense because these churches are getting money. Satan has figured out, I'll just buy these pastors off. You know what it reminds me? Have you ever studied Nazi Germany and what happened to the pastors in, in World War II, uh, yeah, World War II in Nazi Germany? I, I'm, I'm not going to quote it exactly. I'm just going off the top of my head. But Hitler said this about the pastors in Germany because they were state-ran churches and they, were this, they derived their salary from the state of Germany. And he says, these pastors will sell out for their measly salaries. And you know what? A lot of them did. They bought into what Hitler said. And they took down pictures and crosses of Jesus and they put up pictures of the swastika and Hitler because their salary was based on the state giving them money. And it happened. They compromised. So this is why you're seeing all these social justice issues in the church. It's the whore. Let's go outside of the church. What else? How about in the colleges and universities? Oh, she's got her hooks in them. They're completely sold out to her. Because what? Some of these colleges and universities are on their head. So guess what ends up happening? An Islamic organization comes in and says, hey, look, we'll give you millions of dollars. Just build an Islamic center for us and, and build this and be tolerant to Muslims and we'll give you all kinds of millions of dollars. And that's going on in tons of, of universities and colleges. They're getting funded by Islam, straight from Saudi Arabia. And you're like, wow, that's crazy. Yeah, but I mean, what's the, the issue? It's money. It's money. And so a lot of these people are selling out at the college and universities. Just interesting to note, let me bring it to the public school system. Did you know the textbooks that are being used, especially in middle school, especially in California? And there's only a few textbook brands out there. 
Do you know who's funding them? Muslims. All of them? Not all of them, but some of them. And they're written in such a way that when you come to Islam, the teacher will spend six to seven weeks on Islam and how wonderful it is and yada, yada, yada. And then they'll spend a week on Christianity and spend it only on the Crusades. Oh, I, I got it. So follow the money. So the money for these textbooks is being funded from Saudi Arabia and different places like that? Yeah, that's why they're friendly to Islam. Oh, she's got her hooks everywhere. Yeah. Interesting to note, do you know what the ratios are now in colleges with the uber-left professors versus conservative professors? Someone's just going to just be traditional in their values. In some colleges, the ratio is 5 to 1. In some other colleges, the ratio is 12 to 1. And in the history, and this is, notice, notice this, in the history departments, it's 33 to 1 leftist to conservative. Something has happened tragically to our colleges and universities, and it's the whore. She's buying people off. Now, you got that, but then what else? Media and entertainment industry. How come they don't talk about anything that's conservative or Judeo-Christian or anything that would fit our narrative, or, or reality, I should say, and versus if something goes against their narrative, they don't talk about it. They won't mention it. But if it fits their narrative, that's all they harp on for three or four or five days because they get money, big money. They're getting paid off in the back rooms to go with this narrative. That's why someone asked me, you think the media uh, industry is ever going to come back? No, I don't. I don't think Hollywood comes back. I don't think the media comes back. You have to find alternative news sites that are going to tell you the truth. Forget about the alphabet soup, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, news programs. They're gone. They're crazy. They're promoting left-wing agendas because the whore is using them. Then you have the hijacks of the internet, social media, YouTube, Google, Facebook, Twitter. These guys are all leftists. She's got them as well. Big money. And by the way, if you don't play fair, if she doesn't like you, you get erased. Look at Alex Jones, InfoWars, completely erased. Now, you know why they did Alex Jones? It's a test case. They were doing it with a test case because he knows, he, he sometimes says off the wall things. And they say, well, you know, let's see how it goes. Let's erase him from social media and see what the reaction is. And they didn't have any reaction hardly. But guess what? People say, well, who cares if Alex Jones is gone? Because we're next. That was a test case to say, okay, let's get closer to who we really want to erase from social media, and let's start erasing them. Because she doesn't want anybody going against her narrative. She's ruthless. Okay, so what's the theological framework of the whore? And this comes to the, the, the second satanic mystery that Paul talks about in 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 through 10, and he says, uh, he'll use the term mystery. And, and the idea is that the mystery, he goes, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. So that's the second satanic mystery. Well, what is it? It's the framework of the whore. That Satan is perpetrating a program of lawlessness on the world that is in direct opposition to God. And by this lawless program, Satan plans to bring the Antichrist to world power. Now, when I use the term lawless, or the scripture uses the term lawless, it doesn't mean anarchy. So don't get that into your mind. Lawlessness means a complete 180 from what God says. Okay? So if God says, this is wrong, the whore will say, no, it's right. God says, homosexuality, lesbianism, it is an abomination. They'll say, no, it's just an alternative lifestyle. God will say, abortion's wrong. They'll say, no, it's a woman's right to choose. It's the, the flip-flop. It's what Isaiah said. They'll call evil good and good evil. That's what lawlessness is. It's a complete reversal. 
And so that's what's happening. Now, what I'm going to do right now, and I'm going to go very rapidly through this, but I'm going to show you the framework. This is all what she believes. This is lawlessness, okay, what you're getting ready to watch. And I'm going to go pretty quick through it for the sake of time. The first thing you'll see is anti-Judeo-Christian ethics, anti-Israel, anti-Christian, but pro-Islam. You must understand the Red-Green Alliance. Why is the left hooked up with the Muslims? Why is the globalist using the Muslims? Why are they having an alliance? Because the Muslims would turn on them, right? But the globalists see that the way to defeat the West, the way to defeat Christianity, is we'll use Islam as the battering ram to destroy. And so that's why there's this alliance. That's why they never say anything about it. Interesting, why doesn't feminists ever say anything about Islam? They're the worst perpetrators of, women's, uh, 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 of treating women wrong in the world. But they won't say anything about it because they're using them to come at us. Look what they've done to Europe. Completely destroyed them. The globalists have used Islam. So there's that one aspect. Then they'll teach evolution. They've been teaching this for years in the school. Nature worship is what's going on. Worship of Gaia. Uh, relativism, postmodernism. Eric talked about that. Abortion, population reduction. Now we understand how abortion reduces the population, but you guess, guess what the next level we're going to go to in reducing the populations? Health care. Thank you. Well, what do you mean? You know, this whole push for universal health care, single-payer system, and all this other stuff, guess what? When you reach a certain age, say, let's say 65, I don't know, I'm just throwing that out there, they're going to say, oh, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, um, you're past 65, we're not going to do liver transplants on you, we're not going to treat you for cancer, we're just going to give you morphine. Because that's all, that's all we can afford, because we have to ration the health care, because we have to give it to the producing society and you're not producing because you're retired and you don't work or whatnot. So here's a pill. We hope you feel better. And that pill will be what's called soft euthanasia. That's how they will reduce the population. Look, how did Hitler do it? I mean, Hitler had a problem with his health care system. Do you know what he did? He just lined them up and killed them. He said, all right, problem solved. He just killed them. He took all the old people out, and people's grandparents and grandmothers disappeared. No one knew where they went. They took them out and killed them. They also took all the, the, the mentally handicapped people, killed them too. All right, no more drain. They took everyone out that wasn't producing in a society because he was practicing national socialism. And the only way you can have a health care system is you have to have people producing in society. And if they don't produce, well, we kill you. That's coming here in soft euthanasia. Now, they won't line you up. They're just going to say, I'm sorry, Mr. Smith. There's nothing we can do at this point in time. That's how they reduce the population. Yikes. Diversity in families. No more this, this nuclear mommy and daddy thing. We're going to have two men, two women. We're going to teach kindergartners this. Promotion of sexual promiscuity. You and I now are, that's, our mentality towards sexuality is ancient, uh, uh, of chastity before marriage and fidelity in marriage, and that's ancient to them. They, that's not even accepted. If you try to tell them that, they'll say, you're a bigot, you're, you're this, you're that. Different kinds of family structures, are, and the biblical ideal is mocked. You'll see this on TV. Diverse gender identity. We are now accepting people's mental illness as rational. Did you, did you know that? about Especially this gender dysphoria? If you go back in psychology, this was termed mental illness. Seriously. If you didn't know who you were and your gender, they termed it mental illness. And what we find out is these individuals who are struggling with that have high rates of suicide even when they do change their gender. They go, it makes them go nuts because they're not getting the right care that they need. And, and hence, we're now accepting people's 
irrationality and saying, okay, my wife as a teacher has this one kid come in. One day she's a girl, another day he's a boy. And my wife doesn't know what to say about this kid, doesn't know what to call him. Him, her, it, what, this, that, that, it doesn't matter. In the state of California, he can be a girl one day and a boy the next. And then he can go into the opposite locker room all he wants and whatnot. And we're having all kinds of problems in the locker room because Obama made this transgender bathroom thing. And there's places like Target that people have been caught in the women's uh, uh, you know, dressing rooms using a camera, said he was a, a, guy, a girl and he was really a guy pervert. And this is happening even at the high school levels. It's not even safe to send your kids to high school anymore because some pervert could come in there because of this whole transgender thing. When in a society embraces craziness, you're going to go crazy. There's no doubt about it. We've got this whole thing, multiculturalism. This is taught in the schools. This is taught to teachers as something to be celebrated. That we, and it's, again, it's not the, the celebration of someone being Irish or someone being uh, German or someone being uh, from Latin America. Or what, it's not that. It means this. We're not going to assimilate you. You can speak your language all you want. All cultures are equal, and we create a parallel society. That's what it is to break our national patriotism up. Now, this idea of not all cultures are equal, that's not a racist term. It's, just a, like I said the other night, a dominion mandate term. Does that culture obey the dominion mandate? For instance, think about this. If Saudi Arabia did not have oil, where would they be? They'd be intense because that's where they were before this, right? They did not harness any natural resources of their land and try to make anything better until they found oil. And then we still have to go over there and help them and figure out how to get the oil out for them sometimes. But as far as that's concerned, they have not made any contributions to humanity in general like Israel has. And so multiculturalism says you don't have a right to judge Saudi Arabia, or you don't have a right to judge Muslims under Sharia law. That's xenophobic. That's racist. No, I do have the right. Because under the Dominion Mandate, they must be producing positive benefits from their culture. And some cultures simply are a zero, a complete zero. And I'm supposed to say, yeah, come into America and practice Sharia law. Sure. That'll work, or whatever. Bring in the, your other foreign religions, and let's start practicing the Day of the Dead. I was at Disneyland with my kids, and uh, Disneyland's just a, a hop, skip, and a jump from us, and it's the most bizarre place you could ever be now. It's not the happiest place in the world. It's Dante's Inferno. <laughs> I know it says happiest place in the world, but on the back side it says, uh, all ye who enter here give up all hope right now. Um, but anyway, so I'm at Disneyland with my kids, and some of the most bizarre things I'm seeing there, and not only the celebration of the homosexual and lesbian lifestyle, but it's the... They're, they've decorated, not for Halloween, per se, with like, you know, the traditional uh, pumpkins and stuff like that. It's the Day of the Dead stuff. And I'm looking at, wait a second, that's not even our culture. That's from Mexico. And, and by the way, the Day of the Dead in Mexico is one of the most satanic celebrations of any culture who worships the dead. I'm talking about the, even in Buddha, uh, Buddhism, and China, China, Japan, who have ancestor worship. Man, this Day of the Dead thing in Mexico, it's highly satanic. And here we are at Disneyland, and you know, you expect you, you walk around town, you, you know, you see harvest stuff, okay? No, skeleton heads, skulls everywhere at Disneyland. And I'm thinking, wow, this is getting really bad. And so it's infiltrating, and they think it's all cool, and it's wonderful, but it's highly satanic because they're bringing in another culture. 
challenge to patriotism and mold global, global citizens. If you're a patriot, you're a xenophobe. That's their mindset. No private property, we talked about that. Push for collective ownership of the planet. We all own it, they'll say. You don't have a right to your own. Globalism, we talked about that, so I won't spend any time there. Environmentalism, animals and plants are superior to human beings. Humans are to blame for all the environmental problems, is their mindset. Religious pluralism, homosexual lifestyle promoted. Western society is bad. Collectivism, the individuals are important, the community is more important. Federal, state, global control instead of local control. Lack of privacy, data mining. Eric's going to talk about that with technology, I believe. Non-competitive markets, anti-free markets, anti-capitalism, reduction in quality and standards in manufacturing. Facilitator-led replaces teacher-led. They don't want teachers anymore. They want facilitators in the classroom. Group learning, subjective tests, social justice, oppressed victims, identity groups, dependent upon government, obviously, scientific industrial complex. What do I mean by that? Do you understand what's happening to our scientific culture in America? Do you understand that 95% of grants to these guys in these colleges are coming from our government? You think, what's, what's the deal with that? It started happening after World War II. Now what this means is this. These scientists are now becoming political in order to get funding from the federal government. They're not just doing tests because they want to study something. They only study what the federal government wants them to study. So if it suits the federal government to push global warming, and if these guys want money for their grants, guess what? They will go along with what the politician says because they want the grant money. It's now called the industrial or scientific industrial complex, and it's all politically motivated. That's why you have this global warming hoax. Or let's, let's take another example. They'll say, you know what? You know, we, we, we've got to clean up the planet. We've got to stop drinking out of straws. <laughs> In California, I can't get a straw. I can't get a straw. They, they refuse to give me a lid or a straw in California. And, and you know, like in Santa Barbara, you'll get arrested if, if, if you're in a, in a restaurant and you're the owner of that restaurant and you're serving out straws, you're going to jail. That's how radical they are in Santa Barbara. You're nuts. You can't use a straw. You're killing the planet with the straws. <laughs> oh, my Lanta. Again. <laughs> Who, who, who's putting the straws in the ocean? It's not the United States, by the way. The plastic that's going in the oceans are coming from China and Taiwan and Indonesia and those areas where they just throw all their trash into the ocean. It's not the Americans. But, but what is behind the straw thing? Well, you're killing the coral reefs at the Great Barrier Reef, Brandon, by you drinking out of that straw. Really? Yeah, because the coral reefs are all whitewashed, and it's because of you. You're a yuppie, and, and, and you're just abusing the coral reefs. I don't know if you've heard that argument, but that's what they tried to say to me. The coral reefs? That we're bleaching out the coral reefs? Yeah, yeah. By the way, here's the hoax. The coral reef bleaching has been happening since the 1100s, as far back as we can go back. It's a natural occurring thing. It has nothing to do with what's ever in the water or higher water temperatures or straws floating around. It's nonsense. But yet we'll, we'll, we'll pass a law. No straws. It's insane. But what is it? What is it? The whore is taking away your way of living. She wants you to be dependent on the government telling you everything. So let's move to the second leg. Illegitimate economic aspect is what the whore involves. This is the second leg, and we'll see this in Zechariah 5. Then the angel who talked with me came out and said to me, lift up your eyes now and see what this that goes forth. So I asked, what is it? And he said, it's a basket that's going forth. He also said, this is the resemblance throughout the earth. Here is the lead disc lifted up. Now, here's the picture of the vision that Zechariah had. It's referring to the Babylon system. 
The basket represents economy, okay? The lead disc on top of it represents the scales and balances in the ancient world of how you did business. So if you bought grain, you had to measure that grain out on a scale and they would balance out with the weights, right? And that's how you would pay. The lead disc represents a corruption economically, that someone's tilting the, the, the balances where you're not getting a fair deal. So you're catching on with what, what it's, it's an unfair, corrupt economic system is what the vision of Zechariah is trying to say. Again, you go back to the text and goes, this is a woman sitting inside the basket. The woman is the whore of Babylon, the religious aspect. But notice that she's in an economic basket. Then he said, this is wickedness. It's the whore of Babylon. And he thrust her down into the basket and threw the lead cover over its mouth. Okay. So she's inside of it. And it's surrounding by this economic system that she, she cons people into getting. And then it says, then I raised my eyes and looked. And there were two women coming with the wind in their wings, for they had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted the basket between heaven or earth and heaven. So don't mistake this for angels. You will never find a female angel in the Bible. They're all males. These represent two entities that will actually help her. The idea of having stork wings, it's an unclean bird, there's no doubt about that. But the idea of a stork, this is where we get the Hebrew, the Hebrew word hesed. The loving kindness of God comes from the word stork in Hebrew. Why? Because when the Hebrews watched what storks did with their young, they, 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 they will die for their young. They will cover their young in, in, in a fire and die protecting their young. And interesting enough with storks, their young will take care of them in their old age. In fact, they have seen other storks help the older storks fly. It's an amazing animal. But actually, that's where the word hesed comes from in Hebrew. The loving kindness of a stork to its babies and then to the parents. But what is the point that Zechariah is saying? There's two entities and we don't know who these two entities are. Maybe it's the UN, I don't know. But they have a loving care for the whore. A loving kindness towards her and want to see her flourish. And so they're actually going to take her somewhere and center her somewhere. So I said to the angel who talked with me, where are you carrying the basket? And he said to me, to build a house for it in the land of Shinar. When it is ready, the basket will be set there on its base. Shinar is Babylon. But notice the image of the vision in Zechariah says, they're holding it up before they get there between earth and heaven. She's suspended midair. Don't miss this one. It's a counterfeit. The cross that you have on both sides of you did what to Messiah? Suspended him above the earth and beneath heaven. He was in between heaven and earth, right? The cross actually suspended him. What is that a reference to? It's Jacob's ladder. Messiah is the ladder between heaven and earth, right? It's Jacob's ladder. He's suspended up there because he is our bridge. He is our ladder, the way, the truth, and life to get to the Father, to get to heaven, right? So everyone understands that imagery of why Messiah had to be crucified, suspended. He's Jacob's ladder. Okay. Remember, Satan counterfeits Jacob's ladder. When you see the whore suspended between heaven and earth, it's a counterfeit ladder, a counterfeit to Jacob's ladder, a counterfeit to the Messiah and his program. So she, basic in the vision, is going to be supported by these two entities, and we don't know who these two entities are, but they will make her the bridge between heaven and earth. Well, that's interesting. 
In another language, that's what Babel means. It doesn't mean, uh, in Hebrew, it means uh, confusion of languages, obviously, that, like they're babbling. But in another language, Sumerian, I believe it is, and just um, don't quote me on that. But in the other language, Babel means gate of God. That the, what, Neb, what Nimrod was trying to do was create a portal or a bridge or an entryway where humans could go into heaven. It was called the gate of God or the bridge. It was a t complete counterfeit to the Messiah. I find that very interesting because right now, that's what people are doing. They're thinking there's other bridges, other ladders to heaven. Huh. Some pictures of Babylon. This is uh, uh, some of the ancient ruins. Imagine there, as you're looking there, that one day the Antichrist will have his headquarters there and the whore will be centered right there. Amazing. There's the old Nebuchadnezzar building. They've tried to rebuild it, but it's just an archaeological remain. Well, the economics obviously control the religion of the system. And the religion of ba Babylon is pantheism, pantheism. All material is God. Okay, so if we're talking economics, if the earth is God or the universe is God, then what economic system matches it? An economic system based on materialism. Marxism is an economic theory framework that asserts that wealth should be equalized and private property abolished and believes that all there is is material. Socialism, the economics of Marxism means the production owned by the public. Fascism, national Marxism practice state controlled. Communism, the global Marxism practice and state owned. So what you're saying is that these economic systems that we're seeing today is what system she will use economically? Bingo! That's it! There's no more hiding this anymore. If she believes all is God, then her economic systems go hand in hand with her. That's why she hates capitalism. That's why she hates the free market. Because capitalism, m moral capitalism, and moral free market systems are the closest biblical thing you could find on this planet because it uses what God has given somebody and, and tells them you've got to work hard and you've got to produce and you have a, you know supply and demand all the systems that make things work that's why she hates capitalism and hates free market because she doesn't believe in those economics where's this going economically <laughs> not fun it's not fun at all the exclusion from economics if you don't subscribe. What do you mean? Let me give you a couple examples. Right now, Visa and MasterCard are doing deals to say this with politicians. Well, we can't get rid of their Second Amendment. We'll just say that they can't buy a gun using a Visa and MasterCard. You just won't be able to use your cards for it if you're going to buy a gun. Google, Facebook, YouTube are censoring people like Prager University and other things and, and killing people's ability to make money on the Internet. Do you know Google's in bed with China right now? They have a whole social credit system in China where they're watching them on their social media, watching them with cameras and how well they're obeying the communistic government there. Notice this, by 2020 they plan to have 626 million surveillance cameras watching everybody. Right now, if you mess up in China, you can't fly, you can't ride a train, you can't uh, buy property, and you can't put your kid in private school. Last year, 11.14 million people could not fly in China. 4.25 million were prevented on getting on their railroad systems. And that's all by the end of, of April of 2018. That's coming here if we're not careful. 
Southern Poverty Law Center, if they put you on their list, you're the bad guy. Guess who's on this list as far as organizations? Family Research Council, American Family Association, Family Research Institute, ACT, Traditional Values Coalition, Probe Ministries, Jihad Watch, and other Christian organizations are on the Southern Poverty Law Center's system saying they're hate groups. See, what, what they'll do is they'll call you a hate group, a racist, a bigot, and then economically starve you out. Department of Homeland Security, are you aware of this, that you're on there? That your names, per se, if you're an ethno-nationalist, if you're an extreme right-wing group defined as that those who believe in one's personal or national way of life is under attack, or is already lost, if you're anti-global, if you're suspicious of a centralized federal authority, you're on that list. Religious groups that seek to smite the purported, uh, purported enemies of God and the evildoers impose strict religious tenets of laws on society are fundamentalists, then you're on that list. If you're a single issue person, like you're against abortion, you're on the list on the Department of Homeland Security. So what's, where does this go? Well, eventually, we know in the future you won't be able to buy or sell economically unless you play the game. And right now, what they're doing is capping people, hitting the ceiling, so to speak, economically, if you don't play the game now. It's an economic sabotage of Christianity. <coughs> The last leg, and we'll finish on this, political corruption for illegitimate private gain. For all the nations have drunk of the wine, notice the, uh, I, the, the, the metaphor of wine, of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication, the idea of the politicians, with her. And the merchants of the earth have become rich through her abundance of her luxury. So she's trading with them. She's in bed with the political aspects of every nation. And what are they giving? They're, they're giving all kinds of luxury, the abundance of her luxury, luxury items, money, all kinds of things to buy these politicians what they want. Do you think anyone goes into Washington and comes out poor? Everybody I know goes to Washington and comes out a millionaire. How does that happen? They're supposed to be public servants. And how come they, they never return to their own Mount Vernon? How come they stay career politicians and never leave? Why is that? Because there's money involved. Big, big money. And they don't ever, they don't, once they get a taste of it, they don't leave because that's how she sucks you in. Money. I was talking to a lobbyist who lobbies not only in Sacramento, but also in, and he has seen what happens in Washington, D.C. And he says, Brandon, you understand, right off the, the house floor are these rooms and what will happen is a lobbyist group will go in there and put a whole spread of food and all kinds of stuff and, 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 and just create a feast for these politicians and, and, and then provide women for them and then just line their pockets up. And there's a reason why certain politicians vote a certain way. Their pockets are being lined. They're being given women. They're being given all kinds of food, trips to Europe, this, that, all kinds of things. And so, of course, they vote that way. He goes, that's what's happening in American pol politics. And you say, wow, what a corruption. But no wonder they don't want to leave. Huh. Interesting thing. Why are all the wealthy people in the United States leftists, globalists? Why is that? Jeff Bezos, huge Democratic supporter. He's a, the, the owner of Amazon. You just keep going down the list. Microsoft, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Larry Page and Sergio Brin of Google, Michael Bloomberg, the Walton family of, of, of Walmart, Phil Knight of Nike. I mean, they're off the chain. Globalists, leftists. Why is that? Because once you start taking her money, you have to play her game. That's why. And notice this, it says, by, your, by her, your sorcery, all nations were deceived. Sorcery, it's the word in Greek, pharmakia, it's where we get the word pharmacy. It refers in, 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 in the strictest sense, witchcraft, casting spells, potions, medicines, demonic, satanic practices, in order to deceive 
and disorient like drugs do. So what it's saying is that, that her sorcery, she can deceive you and disorient you and make you go crazy for what she offers. And that's what's happening. Like I mentioned, have you noticed people are not in their right mind? They're being bought off, and when they get bought off, what intoxicates them, guys, it's not a secret. The casting of spells that she uses is simply one thing, money. It's intoxicating. It makes the kings of the earth intoxicated with her, and she's got a lot of it. And they do the deal with her, and before you know it, they take the money, their doom is sealed. And what's the tactics? Dumbing down education. I'll give you money if you dumb down the education. Create fake issues. Change the language. Go to political correctness. That's Orwell's newspeak. Propaganda via media, education. Hegelian dialectic. In California, we saw the Hegelian dialectic being practiced. I don't know if you heard this. They came out with a, a, a law, or a, it's a proposed law, and it was going to do this. That it would be illegal for pastors and counselors to counsel anyone out of the homosexual or lesbian lifestyle. If you did that, you could lose your, your license, your job, everything. And then you couldn't sell books to help people out, which inevitably meant that the book that was going to be banned was the Bible. And that's what we were facing in California just a little while ago. Okay, Hegelian dialectic does this. Proposes two opposites, but then ends up with a compromise. So it goes extreme, and then you say, whoa, that's crazy, that's extreme. You're going to ban the Bible? You're going to ban reparative therapy? And then, and then what happens is a compromise is, is made. But this third option, this compromise, never was even suggested before it had happened. So they said, yeah, you know what, that's a little extreme. We don't want to ban the Bible. We don't want to ban counselors and people like pastors to be able to counsel these people. Um, so we're just going to bring it back a notch. But notice, it still moved the ball forward. Instead of having a 10-yard gain, you get a 5-yard gain out of it. You see, that's how the Hegelian dialectic proposed something crazy and radical and then bring it back halfway. Boom! We have got a, a, a situation in California that you're right on the line, man. If somebody you're counseling says, hey, you know what? I don't like how you, you're talking to me. I'm going to report you if you're right on the line right now. They're not banning books. They're not banning the Bible. We're right now, even a secular counsel can't do that. They can't cancel people out of that lifestyle. Whoa. But they, they got their five-yard push. That's how it works. And then sometimes they'll use a Delphi technique on you. What's the Delphi technique? Well, this is group consensus. They put you in a room with a group, and they'll have a facilitator in the room and say, you know what, we all believe that the community needs this and the community needs that. And, and so here you are in that group saying, wait a second, time out. This is all wrong. And they'll say, man, you're crazy. They'll make you feel like you're the crazy one. And then we'll say, well, look, the group feels this way. You're over here. You must be nuts. So we're going to go with group consensus. They do this in schools, by the way. They do this in colleges. They'll have them group up. That's called the Delphi Technique. <laughs> wow. Demonize the Constitution, the culture of, uh, and patriotism, judicial activism instead of con uh, Congress making laws. This is where you see the whore at work. What do you mean? Why is it our Supreme Court is ruling on gay marriage? Why are they ruling on transgender bathrooms or whatnot or baking a cake? Because the Supreme Court is only supposed to review the law not make it. Congress makes the law. That's Civics 101. But what is every congressman or senator doing right now? They are punting it off. Because they're getting paid, and they don't want to lose their job, and so they're punting it off to the Supreme Court so nine guys or individuals can make law? That's not how it works. But that's the whore. Because the politicians don't want to lose the gravy train. 
and we have judicial activism happening right now. That's what all this Kavanaugh thing was about. So you, have, you create a deep state because of this. And there's, there's tons of federal employees, guys, that, you, like I told you, that we can't fire. Think about this. Two million federal employees. $177 million are paid out to these unelected bureaucrats in Washington, and you and I can't fire them. Get that around you, around you, 177 million, 2 million employees. The whore is paying people off and ruining our, our, our system of government. And then the last one is rent -a mob <laughs> See, every time you, you say, well, what's going on here? Just say this to yourself, follow the money. The whore's giving them money. Obviously, George Soros is part of the, the big program of the whore, and he pays people. Did you know at some of these, these uh, mob uh, situations where they were going against the cops and all this other stuff, remember all that, those crazy mob things? Do you know that it was reported that people saw one group of protesters pull up, the other group of protesters pull up in a bus, and they were all shaking hands. Hey, how you doing, Mac? How you doing, buddy? Yada, yada, yada. And they were, they were yucking it up. And then it was like they turned a switch on them and they started opposing each other on the streets. And people would say, what's going on here? Why were they buddy buddies? And then when they went on the streets, it was like they were acting. Oh, yeah, because they're getting paid $15 an hour to act as if they're a raging mob and we're mad about this and we're going to tear down the Supreme Court and we're going to scratch it. These people are rent -a mobs They don't even know what they're doing. But that's what the whore's doing. What's the application for this before we finish? It's a three-legged system, political, religious, and economic. And here's the, the, the baseline in the application. The whore is quite willing to pay you anything as long as you subscribe to her. She will pay you anything. In your own jobs, in your own life, you really have to watch economically the decisions you're making because you may not sense that the whore is right there in front of you. Right now, pastors are having a hard time getting young people into the church. Do you know why? In California, you can blame it on the sports leagues. They play sports on Sunday now. And you think, well, how's that? How, the whore is there? Yeah, 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 no, just follow me here. I'll just give an example. So when hundreds and hundreds of these young adults are on the soccer field on Sunday morning, when they should be in church learning about Jesus, their parents are making a worldly advantage decision saying, well, you know, we got one shot at this. We got one shot at a scholarship. And irregardless of the kids' abilities, right? And, and we've got to give them every advantage they could possibly want. So we've got to devote ourselves to helping our kids. And before you know it, that kid hasn't been in church in a year. He doesn't know anything about Jesus. The whore has won. If she can buy you off like she's buying all these young adults and say, you know what? I'll give you the money. You just give me your kids. She'll take your kids. And she'll pay you anything you want. And that the parents are not seeing that, that they're making economic compromises. I have people that their houses have went upside down in my congregation where the, the, the dad has decided to work overseas or he's gone six weeks out of the year or not a year, six weeks at a time or, or seven weeks or two months because they're working over here and they're working over here and it's like, well, I'm providing for my family. Yeah, but at the same time, you're not home and your home is going upside down, and your kids are getting out of control, and you're not even aware of it because you don't live here in the house. Satan would love for you to leave your family.
He wants the head of the family gone so that he can corrupt what's going on there and turn everything upside down. And they don't see it. They're making economic decisions that are destroying their family and their kids' spirituality. The whore is alive and well in the church. She is working full time. And she's doing it through money. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you, Lord, for all that we can learn about the whore and what she's up to and how she's building this coalition by using her luxury and riches. Help us to be cognizant of that. Help us to be aware of it and what's, what's happening around us. This three-legged stool that Satan is using. Help us to, to sense that and, and guard our families, guard our homes, guard what we're doing, Father. And Lord, uh, as we, we, we get ready to the next session, help us to always have discernment, understanding what's happening around us so we can be wise and know what to do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All righty.